So I, I will introduce myself uh, because. Uh, yes. So I'm an agronomy engineer by design. I have a, a master's degree in physics and a PhD in applied math. And uh, I used to be a scientist as well, on top of a data scientist. And I used R. Uh, well, that was a long time ago, so I used S plus actually before using R. Okay. And then I quit. I said, no more of that. I don't want to program anymore. You know, this is fun, but not your whole life long. Okay. And so I became something else, a consultant, and and then. Uh, a company called KXCN hired me as a pre-sales, and KXCN was automating predictive analytics. And then that company was acquired by SAP. So that's why I'm there now. Uh, but I'm happy, so, you know. And, uh, uh, well, maybe we can start now. Yes, I think we're ready to go. Okay. Take it away. So, are you still searching? ROIs in your big data analytics. I think you should read that. That's an interesting post that uh, we have on KD Nuggets at the moment. Okay, uh, but that's that's true. Many people or many companies had a big data project. They collected data, and now they wonder what they what they will do with it. And uh, actually, we have customers who come to us and say. Well, we have this heap of data. What do what can we do with it? You know, what are the business things that problems that we need to solve? The business have no clue about what's in there actually. Now let's imagine that they have a clue a little bit, okay? And you know, I, I took this. Uh, there was this guy in uh, in Paris uh, uh, a couple of years ago. He wanted to find a needle in the haystack. He's a crazy Italian guy, okay, and he does things like that. And that's a good an an uh, analogy to what we have to do. We have to find needles in haystacks, okay, and that's what we've been doing for the past 30 years. But actually, that's the haystacks we have now. So we have thousands of haystacks and we have thousands of needles because in those A stacks, so all the data sources we are collecting, there are many more questions that business could ask. Okay, so we have a big problem, and you cannot burn the A stack, of course, to get the needles. That's too easy. So uh, we have a big problem, and that big problem is we need to scale. Okay, we need to scale to the number of questions that will eventually arise when people understand what is in those data. All the interactions with the people, I could optimize all that. All, I'm in a, in a, at a manufacturer, I have all these sensor data, I have compliance problems with uh, the production, all that is many, many needles that I need to find. So how do we scale to that? Interestingly, uh, I took uh, this analogy as well. Um, what is common between the Industrial Revolution and the evolution of IT? Uh, well, technology first. Okay, Without technology, you don't do anything. You don't evolve. Second is you need some raw material you work on. Well, it is data now, it was uh, coal and stuff like that before. And you build something that uses the raw material to provide you know, new things. And that was machines at the time, and that's what we have today is computer software. So how do we do that in IT usually? We say, First phase, we develop ad hoc. Great. I have new ideas, I develop something. Okay? It's great, but it's very manual. It's hardly maintainable. You know, uh, I still remember uh, having customers having huge 
things with ACS, and someone is sick, and nobody knows what's going on anymore because it's not documented and stuff like that. Okay, and same with R. You know, when I was writing my R code, I was giving it to someone else. He had no clue. Okay. And then we go to tools, because that's the only way that we will, we will scale. So you have that with ETL, you have that with ERP, you have that with business intelligence, you have that everywhere. So now is the time for data science and predictive analytics. And what do we get from the experience of the other areas, like ETL and stuff. Well, interestingly, it doesn't change the size of the teams. And actually, it may even increase the size of the teams. Okay? Uh, much more is done with usually equal quality. And we are much more innovative because we save time using those tools we can reuse for other things. So, developing new things. And of course, we provide more value for the company in the end. So, that goes to what we think, what our vision is for predictive analytics at SAP. And it's fairly simple, is to say, and this is, for me, completely in line with what we see every day. Predictive analytics is something that we will deploy everywhere. And we want that everyone who wants or can or actually maybe will not be aware, but uh, can receive predictive results to optimize the business. And even your customers, you know, I'm a retailer, or I will push them predictive results to change their behavior. That's what we want to do. We want to scale out predictive where anyone, well, we all use weather data today, that's predictive. Well, it could be on everything. It will be on everything, okay? But for that, we need a predictive factory. So we need to be able to create, deploy, maintain, and I will explain the maintenance part, as many models as we need to cover the business needs. Okay? So that's what we want to deliver, and that's what we already deliver, actually, today. So today, what we have is, first, the data is key, right? We all agree with that. Actually, we all say that 80% of the time we spend is on organizing the data to do the, first, the, the next things about the algorithmics, okay? Uh, actually, I think in, in the courses of statisticians and people like that, that's not covered enough, but that's uh, another topic. Uh, and what we said is, Again, the data, if we are in a big data environment where we have collected all that information, should not go out of that environment. We need to be able to transform the data into the data sets we need into that. That means that we will use, well, Hive is slow, but certainly Spark SQL to be able to get the data sets we need whenever we need them. Okay, so if you think about what uh, we have with other stuff like BI, it's the logical layer we need to have between the data structure we have in Hive or in, in Spark and the data sets we need. I'm not talking about the structuration of the data, actually, and I, I will cover that uh, just uh, a little bit later. The second part is if I want to scale, I need to be able, again, to have an automated way of training models. So that's the KXCN technology that SAP acquired. 
which means that I can take a data set and I have an engine which is robust enough that I will get a predictive model. And I will be able actually to measure if I can put it on production, in production automatically. And that, of course, with everything running in the Spark environment, so that I don't get out any data. Third is, well, we have a, a problem. All these models, especially when human beings are involved, their uh, life expectation is very short. I mean by that, that the changes in the uh, behavior of the people, of the market, and so on, means that the results you will get will eventually be completely stupid. So that's something that we absolutely also need to industrialize. And that's what we call the predictive factory, actually. So the ability with the two, the two other bricks to get the data sets whenever we need them and control, and if the control is not good in, enough, to recalibrate from the whole data set. And third, uh, we need also to be able to deploy. So here we can do the batch deployment, but there are many use cases where we want also to be able to deploy real time. And that means today, and we are working on that actually to make it even more easy, uh, that we export code that can be directly embedded, for example, in the Spark streaming. So Java code, for example. Tomorrow, we want even the data manipulation part of that to be exported as one object that can then be embedded into the stream. And the whole data transformation to the probability, for example, will be done at once. You know, predictive in certain way, if you, if you think about it, is a self-learning ETL process. That's exactly what we are doing here. So how does it work? Well, the first thing is you have files in HDFS, structured, non-structured, whatever, and you need to structure them. So that's the part where you work first, <laughs> of course because you have to structure all this information in two tables views that we can then use. We, are, we only use, at the, as of now, structured data as inputs. Then uh, we create this logical layer, which is basically the transformation we want to apply on these tables views to get the data sets we need. And that as Spark SQL, which gives you the data set. So imagine you have 1,000 models, you will have 1,000 data sets. They are all different, of course. And that is consumed by the engine we have in Spark to create the model automatically. Of course, <coughs> there is some communication there with the, our server, but all that can also be piloted by the predictive factory and also scripting or APIs. You want to embed that into an application, you can use the APIs, it's fully transparent. So you change all the uh, UI, basically, and uh, you get your own, your own interface to uh, what we can do. So here, on the native Spark modeling part, what happens is the data is transformed there. There is absolutely no data that goes out. Okay, It's all processed locally in Spark. And we only get the stats to uh, be able to report on what was done. Uh, so I said our challenge is scaling. How do we scale? If you take all that back, okay? We say, well, we handle all the technical problems of modeling. Modeling is not a problem anymore, right? 
I've built in days thousands of in well in in a day more than a thousand models, and I could deploy them. I was okay with that. So all the multicollinearity stuff, the missing data, the outliers, there are technical ways. You know, it, it's uh, again the same thing. Uh, we can find a theoretical framework in which this is not a problem. And of course, uh, if you think about some of the things we do, they come from the 30s where computers didn't exist. So uh, maybe we can change that. OK. Um, we measure the robustness, of course. And the robustness is about giving you the trust in putting the model in production. So if I have 1,000 models, maybe I'll have some that I have to reject and rework. But the vast majority, if I have enough positive cases, I can put in production automatically. Of course, we parallelize the processing. So compared to what I can do uh, today on the server, we, multi we divide the time, the training time by 10. And this is expanding again. And this was already fast. So, uh, and today we support, and this is only tested, 50,000 columns. We aim at 500,000 columns. Okay, that's a big data problem, and variety of the data means lots of columns. Uh, so we can produce those data sets automatically when needed. So, and that's also what is interesting. It's all embedded. Uh, a chain, a process where all the parts are together. Management of the model, so of course control, whenever you want, and that's again automated, that's tasks you, you define. Uh, automated recalibration on the whole data set. You started with 500,000, you will recalibrate on 500,000 because you don't know what changed. And maybe all that you had in the previous model is completely gone, okay? Um, so I will pass that, and I will go to this example. So uh, it's for an airplane manufacturer, so there are not so many in the world. So I will not tell you where they come from in this way. You, you have to guess. Um, and it's about uh, quality of production. So. One of the, 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 ch the challenges they have, of course, is if you have a um, chain of production with sensors, the first thing is to collect all that data and to put it together. Okay. The second phase is, of course, analyzing. That's maybe not the that's maybe the simplest one, and the third part is providing ways for human beings to take decisions or to be alerted and do something. And so they have a cluster with roughly one petabyte of data from five lines of production. When you look at the data that is there, you have roughly 500 sensors per line. And one of the difficulty, of course, is that some provide information at the millisecond, and some provide information at the hour. So we have to be able to put all that together in a way which is a coherent way. Uh, we have data coming from, uh, actually, usually SAP systems. <laughs> for example, uh, work orders for maintenance. Everything is recorded. You know exactly what happened on all the machines which are on the chain of production. You have ev all the information, again, from uh, the legacy systems about the spare parts, raw material, origin, quality, everything. Uh, you have, and you have, at the end, the quality of what is produced. And that's not at the end. That's at every step of the process, manufacturing process, you have compliance. Is my product that I just 
built, or is this thing that I put to, uh, are those things that I put together compliant with the quality that is set for, for that specific step? So you can imagine that um, that is the challenging way. W what we are working at the moment is five different uh, models, okay? Uh, it's one on composite, uh, making composites, and that's all about, you know, temperature, c composition of the composites, and so on. Uh, and there are other things. But what they want from these five is extend to roughly 250 models on that chain of production, okay? And the challenges we have, they are the usual challenges we have, which are really defining the business problem, clearly defining it in a way that we can express it in terms of data sets. And uh, maybe I will uh, take a minute on that, but that's really the role of the data scientist. Okay, the data scientist is the guy who can understand what business says and transform that into the right data in the right format to get the right result, which is spot on with the business problem that is asked by the business. Because if you don't do that properly, what happens? You will get, well, first, you lose credibility <laughs> because you are providing information which is not the right one, okay? So business say, well, is this crap? You know, they are alerting me when things are right. And then you have a big adoption problem, okay? So, and that is what we learn, okay, really, when we are studying how to transform these business questions into uh, predictive things, and predictive things are first data sets, first. The algorithmics, that's uh, whatever. Uh, and then there is a scalability problem again, because here the team is five people. Okay, five. So they're gonna manage at the end 250 models for this line of production. And they will be pulled in other projects. So one of the problem is the definition, and I, I'm afraid I couldn't uh, listen to the, the, that part, that presentation uh, earlier about feature definition. But this is crucial. And, you know, I have uh, a sensor measuring the temperature somewhere. I have a pressure sensor. How do I normalize the way I will transform this data to make it available for all the models I need to build? That's things that we need to define or they need to define in their environment to be able to scale as well. Well, I will try to speak Swedish. <laughs> so, tack så mycket. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much.